Thank you for the introduction. So today I'll be giving a very application-oriented talk, right? And uh, yeah, so it'll be quite uh, different to what we've seen up until now, right? So when I was invited to this uh, wonderful workshop, I probably thought, the, the organizers probably thought I'd be talking about my work on uh, colorization and uh, image in painting, but sadly, I'm gonna talk about something I consider more interesting, which is uh, sketch simplification, which is a bit of a niche application of uh, computer graphics, right? So to put it a bit into context, uh, when you're drawing, uh, it can be roughly divided into uh, four stages, right? So the first would be a uh, rough sketch drawing, where you sort of a uh, yeah, rough sketch with pencil and paper. Then you convert this to clean uh, digital line drawings. After you proceed to do simple colorization, and finally you would uh, complete it with uh, tone, shading, etc., etc. And of course, this can be done in a more uh, detailed manner, right? So it's, it's a fairly labor intensive, and one of the most uh, labor intensive stages is that of uh, converting into a clean line drawing. Here you can see an uh, example video. This is uh, sped up 300 times, right? So this is uh, extremely labor intensive and something that has to be repeated a lot, especially when, um, when you're iterating over designs and that sort of thing. So this is um, uh, a result of a sketch simplification with a neural network. You probably look at this and if you're not very used to this, you don't really understand what's going on. So I can sort of break it down and show small parts, right? So, so as a machine learning problem, it's, it's fairly complicated. Because you have lots of, um, it depends a lot of on, on the context. So you can have multiple lines that have to be simplified into one line, right? But you can also have cases where multiple lines have to become uh, multiple parallel lines, depending on the context, right? And you can also have many different styles. For example, here, this, uh, this is probably a shoulder, and it's been drawn three times, right? And this also has to be simplified in one. Uh, you can have this sort of ambiguous, sort of uh, the, the terminations of the hair are sort of ambiguous, and this also has to be cleaned up. You can also have more geometric type drawings and also uh, pretty hard to understand type drawings, right? And this is something that uh, we are trying to solve, right? And so there are, very, uh, there are quite a few characteristics here. So I'm, I'm gonna be talking about a particular problem, but you can probably extrapolate many different parts of this talk to different problems, right? And so one of the, the things here is that in contrast with normal images, right, with the natural images, the inputs and the outputs are sparse. Right? Another problem here, I'll, I'll talk more about this later on, is um, uh, the data is extremely hard to obtain. And further all, there's a very large diversity in the input and the output, right? So um, basically the drawing styles and uh, have evolved a lot and lots of people have different drawing styles. So um, when you evaluate this sort of thing, it becomes a problem of uh, generalization. So you really have to work hard to have this generalized. And here you can see, for example, some different approaches and yeah. As expected, due to the projector, you can't really see it, but uh, there's lots of tone shading here, which has sort of just disappeared. Well, anyway, the slides are online, so if you look it on your computer, you'll probably see uh, it in more detail. And there's another uh, pretty uh, important problem here. Uh, the, this might not seem like a lot, if you're, but if you're uh, used to doing automatic evaluation with validation sets or, or uh, evaluating on test sets, this is not possible with line drawing. And this can be, um, simp you, you could think it would be possible, for example, this is a ground truth image. If you displace the, Im the same image four pixels, you get an MSE error of 0 0.027. If you displace it eight pixels, right? So this image is fairly large, it's probably like 600 by 600. You get uh, 0 0.03, right? So you can think, well, I can use MSE to validate it, right? Because I mean, the more it gets displaced, the more it gets deformed, the larger error it becomes, right? Yeah, but then you can put a white image, right? And then you'll see a 31% drop, right? In your loss, right? So um, this is actually a, a fairly bad local minimum in terms of optimization that if you don't really do a good job of it, it's going to end up always up opening white because that actually works fairly well loss-wise, right? And this is something you have to worry. So on the plus side, we're not gonna be overfitting to the validation or the test set because we can't actually fit to it, right? On the minus side, uh, it, uh, evaluation becomes much more harder and uh, you can't just um, so, uh, automatic grid search type of stuff with hyperparameters, right? So uh, it ends up being lots of uh, manually checking and doing user tests to actually evaluate this. But at least we're not overfitting, right? So some related work. Um, there's lots of uh, work on this topic in the computer graphics community. Um, there's lots of work on, first on more uh, vector type sketch simplification. 
So lots of work on this. Uh, Professor Igarashi also did work on this. So you have progressive online modification, stroke reduction, stroke grouping, and that sort of things. But this is all working on vector inputs and vector outputs, right? And so this is not applicable to the general case of our rough sketching. And then you also have lots of vectorization approaches, which the goal here is to convert a raster image into a vector uh, representation, right? Which allows for um, unlimited scaling and easy editing. But these are, well, these are mainly based on uh, Bezier curve fitting, and they use uh, image gradients. But they still require fairly clean input sketches, and they're not able to actually improve this. So, uh, yeah, and related, um, we'll be, of course, using a, a deep learning based approach, and uh, related are the fully convolutional networks, which I'm surprised I haven't seen very many in this workshop. And uh, I'll also talk about a, a sort of different use of uh, generative or virtual networks, uh, mainly on, as using the, the adversarial loss as a sort of a proxy for a, a structural loss. And so first I'll sort of define what we're trying to optimize. So the, the basic thing here is um, you want to have your, your sketch simplification model, which would be parameterized by a, a deep neural network, right? And then you have this uh, set of uh, supervised training data, which is uh, rough sketches and the corresponding uh, line drawings, right? So the rough sketch would be X and the line drawing would be uh, Y star, right? And uh, the fairly simple approach of optimizing this is you're basically trying to optimize uh, the expectation, right, of the output minus the, uh, well, the L2 norm of the output minus the uh, ground truth data. So this is basically you're just optimizing MSE, right? And you're doing this in a supervised manner. And this would be the, the, the basic approach to doing sketch simplification or, or any sort of um, image output processing, right? So this has uh, also been fairly popularized. So with uh, GANs being pretty much everywhere these days, what you can do, I won't be talking about GANs because I, I'm assuming everyone knows everything about them, but basically we are introducing a discriminator model, right? And this discriminator model is trying to see if the uh, output of the S model is natural or not, right? And so what happens here is you're basically, uh, now, now the problem is no longer a simple minimization problem, it's a min-max problem. And if you've done any research on GANs, you know this is extremely unstable and this will give you lots of headaches down the road. But it gives good results in this case, right? And so what we do here is we simply, we're uh, adding to the um, MSE loss, we're adding the adversarial loss, which would be basically the GAN loss, right? And here we add uh, a weighting parameter, which we get uh, the alpha, right? So here what we're trying to do is maximize this discriminator network that is trying to predict if it's a real or a generated uh, sketch simplification. And the sketch simplification network is trying to minimize MSE loss while trying to uh, trick the discriminator network. And this is uh, something that you see lots in semantic segmentation, super resolution, and it's pretty standard these days. But here, what we'll also be doing is we'll try to use uh, unsupervised data. I'll, I'll motivate it a bit later. So we'll assume we have an unsupervised data set of clean uh, sketch images, so line drawings, and a data set of rough sketches, right? But these are not corresponding, right? This is not supervised data. This is uh, unsupervised data of both domains. And what we can do here is now we can add two expectations, and we're trying to, uh, at the same time we're, we're doing this uh, supervised uh, adversarial loss, we're trying to also now, uh, trying to min uh, in this case this would be the maximize the discriminator prediction on the true line drawings, and uh, try to predict that the generated sketches of these uh, unsupervised drawings and at the same time, we're minimizing the opposite. So basically, what we have here now is you have the top row would be a supervised loss, which consists of MSE and an adversarial loss, and at the bottom, you have a more sort of GAN unsupervised type loss. And here, what happening is you're using three different types of data. So you're using a supervised data set and two unsupervised data sets. And to put it a bit into context, so this would be the standard supervised training. This would be a conditional GAN. In conditional GAN, what you're doing is you're actually, to the discriminator, you're also uh, conditioning on X, right? And if you look at this, you can see quickly that this does not allow you to use unsupervised data. And what we're doing here is we're combining the supervised adversarial training with uh, unsupervised data and augmentation, which uh, the right-hand side, as you can see, is, is pretty much a standard GAN for formulation. And why are we doing this? So uh, if you look uh, at the data set we've, we've used sometimes, um, you can see that it's this sort of images, right? So these are done by the same, more or less, uh, five illustrators. I'll talk about that a bit later. But these are fairly similar type of images. But if you look at rough sketches in the wild, right, you have this sort of data, right? And later on, I'll, I'll talk about how you can build this data. 
but by when you build this data, it also introduces a bias, right? And so this will give you poor generalization to the general case. So we want to handle all these very uh, thin, uh, so it's very, this is drawn with blue pencil, it's very hard to see, this has heavy shading, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that is the main reason we want to use uh, unsupervised. So it's all not only cutting costs on uh, generating data and on trading data, but it also improves the generalization, which is the main goal here. And to see it a bit more visually, so this would be your, your supervised data. You have your input, your output. In this case, you have the S model, the discriminator model, and then you're backpropagating the MSC and uh, the adversarial loss at the same time, right? And this is, uh, well, you can see this, uh, this has uh, directed a cyclic graph. And then on the unsupervised case, you have this sort of uh, not corresponding rough sketches and line drawings, and you're uh, updating in a sort of GAN type way. And so if you look at it in global on, you're optimizing this at the same time. So you'll optimize first uh, the discriminator network using both supervised and unsupervised data, and then you update the, the simplification network. In this case, uh, you're not using those line drawings, but you're using the rough sketches and the supervised data. The network we're using here, so this will be a bit different of what you're used to. So this is a 23 layer fully convolutional neural network. As a characteristic, the output and the input are the same. So there's the same dimension and also one channel grayscale images. This, uh, as you can all tell, it's an encoder decoder type architecture. What's good about this is you're reducing the spatial usage and what's more important here, and a very important factor is uh, spatial resolution, right? So uh, one thing I haven't really mentioned is but Illustrations are high resolution, right? So um, when you do classification stuff like that, it's like 200 by 200. Here we can work up to 4K resolution, right? So it's 4,000 by 300 pixels and stuff like that. And so you actually, when you're computing with this fully convolutional type networks, for each output pixel, you're computing that uh, from a patch on the input image, right? And if this patch is small, you're not going to be able to get good predictions. And the only way to increase this is by either increasing the, the filters of the um, convolutions or making it deeper, right? And uh, the standard approach these days, is to, as inspired by VGG, is to use three times three convolutions and just make the network deeper. In this case, it's uh, 23 convolutions, uh, convolutional layers, and we're reducing the resolution three times by half. So at the middle, it's processing at uh, one eighth width and one eighth height. And afterwards, we restore it. And uh, this is basically done with uh, the deconvolution type, and this is uh, the down convolution is done with a stride of two. And the model here, it's uh, trained from scratch. This is a visualization of the training. You can see this jittering, which happens quite a bit. And this is a, uh, a problem when, if you try to use a validation. What we do first is uh, we train it by using MSC only. And afterwards, we train with a full loss. Why? Mainly because uh, GAN is horribly unstable. And if you try to train everything from scratch, it gives you lots of problems. And in particular, we're training with 424 by 424 patches with MSC only. And when we switched to GAN, basically to be able to define a, a discriminator in a more clean way, we switched to 384 by 384, but you could probably train everything 384 by 384. And in this case, batch normalization, and we're using add a delta because we want to minimize the, the hyperparameters. And add a delta in contrast with Adam heuristically determines the learning rate, which uh, minimizing hyperparameters when you cannot uh, use a validation set is fairly important. As you can see, as it progresses, it eventually uh, sort of starts converging. But what's actually fun about the training about this is that it converges very fast to a more s or rough approximation, but to actually get good results, you actually have to leave it training quite a bit. And as I mentioned, one of the things here is we, we actually, ideally, we want vector outputs. And as you know, a, a, sh a fully convolutional neural network is going to output a raster image. And in order to convert it into vector, we did basically simple, um, we used open source software called PO Trace. And this is basically a high pass filter plus binarization, and then it does some very simple uh, vectorization. And this allows that if your network outputs fairly clean images, you can get fairly clean vector images, which you can uh, scale infinitely and stuff like that. And one of the, the main thing you can control when running it, so this is fully automatic approach, but one of the things that you know is that the fully convolutional neural networks are not actually scale invariant, right? So they're robust to translations because um, if you translate the input, the, imp the output gets translated. Well, there's a bit of a noise introduced by the padding, but uh, r uh, roughly that. But what happens is if you introduce the input image at different resolutions, you'll get different resolution outputs, right? And so basically the lower resolution you input it, the more uh, simplified outputs you get. And that's sort of uh, the one knob you can use when uh, running this in practice.
So I'll talk a bit about uh, making data. So uh, as you probably noticed a bit at the GAN talk from yesterday, um, data is probably one of the most important things uh, in real world applications. And obviously there was no data set for this, so we had to create our own. In particular, we're using 68 pairs of rough uh, and target sketches. And they were done by five illustrators, right? And so there are these images, these are fairly high resolution, and from there we cut the patches which are used in training. And of course, uh, yeah, so one of the issues we found a lot is that if you tell people to convert a rough sketch into a clean line drawing, they're going to do something like on this left, right? And as you all know, trying to opt, so this red is the output, and on the bottom is uh, the rough pencil input, right? So if you're trying to convert the bottom to the output, and you're using MSC, what's going to happen is this is going to blur, right? I'll show some results afterwards, but this is going to blur. So this is not a loss you can actually use. So this is not uh, data you can actually use, right? So what we did is uh, we found this problem quickly early on. And we said, so the only way to actually get this to correspond, instead of creating the line drawing from the rough sketch, is to do the inverse creation, right? So what we have is we have this clean line drawing. And from there, we're going to generate a rough sketch. This will introduce a bit of a bias, because the rough sketches won't be as natural as they would be if drawn uh, like on the left. But this creates a corresponding data, which is something that you can actually use for training, right? And this is fairly important, because if you don't do this, you'll get results like this, right? Basically, the optimal solution in the case that the data is not perfectly aligned is going to be just blurring it so that uh, it gets a, a large corresponding area, right? And this is not something we want. And of course, uh, 68 pairs of data seems very little when you're using a 23-layer fully convolutional network. So uh, we did lots of data augmentation, right? In this case, we're trying to make as possible the network uh, scale invariant, although it, uh, as you saw before, it's, it's not working that well. But we scale the data fairly heavily, so I think up to eight times. We're doing uh, random cropping, flipping rotation, and we also do some uh, line rough sketch oriented data ornamentation, which is um, some tone adjustments, uh, slurring, and also here you can't see because of the projector, but there's actually Gaussian noise added to this. And for the unsupervised data, these were obtained from, due to uh, copyright, I can't show most of it, but this was obtained from uh, diversity of sources, known illustrators, web searches, uh, manually verified all from different authors, from the training data, and in the end, uh, we augmented this with uh, roughly 200, 100 of each. To show a bit of results on this, so um, yeah, this is a bit old, but yeah, basically, you have to run this on GPUs, and these fully convolutional networks get uh, roughly four, 50 times speed up. And still, it's it's fairly heavy network, right? But this is for a fairly large resolution, even though now we're working with much larger. And here you can see compa comparison with the standard tools. So standard tools are fairly simple, obviously non-deep, uh, heuristic type stuff. But you can see that, for example, it keeps lots of noise. It does not uh, simplify lines, etc. And it can also miss uh, important lines, while our approach is actually able to do a fairly good job at uh, adjusting and uh, putting them together. And th th here it's um, only MSE. Afterwards, I'll show some results using the at virtual loss. And of course, to evaluate this, as I mentioned, you cannot use a validation loss. So the only way to do it is actually to do user tests, right? And this is uh, time consuming, expensive. So it's something you want to avoid as much. But fair, basically, comparing against existing tools, we get pretty much 100% uh, preference over them. But one of the problems that uh, I haven't shown, because, because of the post-processing, so what happens is um, the deep network, since it's learning this with MSE loss, when you learn only with an MSE loss, the areas where it has little confidence, it tends to blur them, right? And visually, this is very jarring to see this sort of uh, blurring and stuff like that. So this is a very hard one. Uh, so in general, all the results I'm going to show are from illustrators not used in training. So this is our generalization results. And here you can see, for example, that it blurs in areas where it has little confidence, right? And by using the post-processing approach of a high-pass filter, you, as you can know, you can eliminate this, but this also eliminates some important lines. And if you use adversarial loss, uh, you do not need post-processing, which is one important thing, because you're actually using, um, so by, by introducing the discriminator, it's, it's trying to force, it's forced to make more realistic outputs in a sort of structured prediction way. And that makes it so that blurry stuff is not good. And, and the network learns that blurry stuff is not good. It's not realistic, right? It does not fool the discriminator, but it makes blurry stuff. And so it can give us clean images without uh, vectorization. Uh, yeah, and uh, so that's uh, one of the good things. 
And another good thing is if we compare using, for example, the adversarial law, so this is supervised MSE and adversarial, and we compared using the unsupervised data, we can see there's an improvement in generalization, right? And those, this is uh, the main point, uh, the main reason and the main motivation to use this sort of uh, adversarial training for unsupervised data. Here we can see some more results. So these are basically, you can see this is a fairly hard result here. You have uh, lots of overlapping lines and that sort of stuff, and it does a, a fairly good job here. Here, once again, it does a, a fairly good job. And here, this is a, yeah, a, f a famous uh, Japanese uh, illustrator. And you can see here that in the top row, it's a bit harder to see, but uh, you can see lots of missing lines get completed, which is fairly important. So here, uh, it's fairly important to have fairly, fairly high accuracy, and it's, so this is not really reflected in, in the loss or anything like that. And this is something fairly complicated to do, and, and stuff like these lines, even though it seems like, uh, if you look at the loss, this is a fairly small difference, but visually, it's fairly jarring. So by actually uh, using the full approach, we are able to recover these things and get fairly good performance. Of course, uh, we ran a user test. We compared with uh, using only MSC. This is, uh, I think, 100 images, stuff like that. And, and we can see it's, uh, we get uh, statistical significant improvements over the previous, over using MSC only. And so this was, well, it was a sort of how to use unsupervised data like this. But uh, one of the interesting things you can do is once you, once you can train with unsupervised data, is you can change paradigms from an inductive paradigm to a transductive paradigm. So what does that mean is, uh, since you can use unsupervised data directly, you can use the test data as unsupervised data, right? And so that allows you to use the test data, fine tune on the test data from the full model, this is a bit heavier than using normal inference because you actually have to backpropagate and, and optimize using the, train, uh, the training data set at the same time as a, you're using the test data set. But it, what it allows you to do is, for example, this image, that with a pre-trained model, it gives no good result. By optimizing with a test image, so in a transductive paradigm, you can actually get it to output something, right? And here you can see another example where, for example, the, the facial features are missing with a standard model. But if you optimize this uh, online, right, in a transactive paradigm, you're able to recover these small features. And not only that, one of the other things you can do with this is, uh, so this is a, a, a more or less general framework. Uh, it really shines when you have, um, when it's hard to get data and you can, but you can collect unsupervised data of both uh, the outputs and the inputs. But you can also apply it, for example, to um, the inverse problem which is basically you switch the input and the output data sets. And this is now creating a sort of uh, pencil drawn style from uh, clean drawings, right? And here you can see it's sort of adding lots of noise and this is basically the, the adversarial loss at, in action, right? And this is, so if you use an MSC loss, it's a bit hard to see, it just blurs it uh, as expected. But you can train this, for example, with different artists, with drawings from different styles and you can get different Fairly hard to see with this projector, but fairly different styles. So this is a much more noisy and, and uh, dirty style of drawing. And this is a, a one where they mark with a pencil harder. And they tend to put lots of uh, parallel lines, overlapping lines. And so and we also have some work on, on uh, line in painting. But what was interesting with this is that, well, I saw this um, similar stuff these days. So what lots of people were looking at is uh, the eigenvalues, right, of the outputs of the different layers. And we did something like that, right? So uh, basically what we did is we, you input an image, you run it through the model, and for the output responses of the filters of the different models, you can look at the PCA responses, right? So we're basically ordering the, the different eigenvectors uh, by the eigenvalues. And you, what you can see is that, for example, you're inputting this cat in the first eigenvalues, right? So first PCA values, you can see that the cat appears, right? And in the middle layers, you can see there's sort of cat appears and some information, but it, at the end, it becomes sort of noise, right? And if you go deeper on, what happens is that the first layer has lots of information, but from the second layer on, it basically uh, drops very fast. So the, the eigenvalues are dropping really fast. And so we saw, sort of saw this, and uh, empirically, we thought, well, this sort of means that probably there is more information being contained in these first layers in these specific problems. And in the later layers, there's less information being conserved, right? And so origi originally our model was symmetric, following the semantic segmentation models. But this has allowed us to optimize a model by reducing the number of filters in the latter layers. 
and sort of making the number of filters proportionally to the number of uh, sort of uh, interesting areas, uh, interesting PCA values you can find in this. And this is sort of a, an empiric justification of this. And uh, you can do this, and this allows you to optimize a model in a sort of different way of doing uh, weight pruning or binarization, right? And this has let us uh, reduce significantly the, the computation type on this. So uh, sort of as a conclusion, so this is a, a problem that uh, uh, most people are probably not familiar with, but I think it's a fairly complicated problem representative of, of many different uh, complicated parts of machine learning. And this, the general trend, of course, is uh, adversarial learning is beneficial. This can eliminate post-processing and this sort of thing that you can sort of see similar results in super resolution. It allows uh, super semi uh, supervised training, also transductive learning. And you can do other tasks like pencil drawing generations. The limitations, well, of course, uh, you can't sort of depend completely on the unsupervised data. Supervised data is critical for high performance. And it's still very hard to uh, obtain data from many different people, right? And of course, uh, as with most adverse works that use adversarial loss and, like, and stuff like that, it's, they are highly unstable, right? And even though there's lots of work actively being done on this, it's far from being solved. And future directions, of course, it's moving a bit away from um, deep networks, trying to do vectorization in, in one single stage. And this would be more sort of a graphical model, uh, CRF type processing, of course, colorization. And the transductive learning part is sort of, uh, we sort of added at a last minute, but it's probably one of the more interesting parts that uh, probably can, something can more serious can be done on that line of work. And we have some new results, which sadly I'm not able to present today. But uh, for example, this is a much harder uh, rough sketch. Uh, their diversical approach is giving something like that. And our current approaches are giving something like this. And as you can see, this is, um, so there's intersections, parallel lines here. It's actually able to reduce them fairly well, and also the leg area. And it's also able to, for example, generate the hand here. And this is. Uh, quite different from what we've been doing up until now, but yeah, sadly, uh, hopefully I'll be able to present it in a few months. And so thank you for listening. So it's a bit fast, but I mean, probably everyone's tired and this is the last session, so it's better that way. So if you're interested, uh, all the papers, all that sort of stuff is on my website. You can try this online. And also the, the code and models are available. So uh, thank you for listening. I'll take any questions if you have them. Uh, no, no, because uh, I talked with a person developing that and their approach is uh, fairly limited. So it's not actually applicable to most of the rough sketches we're using here that are fairly complex. But yeah, I probably should. Any others? So how do you think about using another those function than the mean squared error? For example, we can use the what's testing maybe? So yeah, so that's something that it's not clear what is the best loss function there. So I haven't tried too much with that. I've tried uh, weighted MSE, weighted variance of MSE, and L1. And what I've found is that uh, the L1, even without that versial part, uh, has a bad tendency to get stuck in a local minima where everything becomes white, right? And so you can try to avoid that by sort of converting into a weighted L1 to try to increase the, the weight of the black lines, right? But still, it's not clear. But yeah, uh, probably using the some so, some other sort of like earth mover distance loss or something like that might be a bit better. But yeah, it's still not clear. So there's lots of things here you can do, and I haven't talked about it, but you can try to enforce uh, sparsity constraints and that sort of stuff. And um, because the, the data is sparse, and it's probably the weight should also be sparse. But uh, yeah, it's something uh, future work. Thanks. When you reduce the spatial resolution and then you go back up, do mm -hmm. you have any kind of skip connections that uh, allow you to transport the precise location? No. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, we didn't use skip connections because we found that when you use skip connections, it has a tendency to overfit, right? So learning goes faster, but it has a hard. Uh, so by actually using an encoder, uh, decoder type model, you're actually forcing it to learn a uh, sort of small resolution repre internal representation and rebuild it from that, right? And I think adding this constraint actually forces the model to, to learn more representative things and generalize better. And that's one of the things we saw in practice, that skip connections just help the gradients, help the propagation, help the learning, 
but uh, make it harder to actually get good results at Generalize Well. And that's the same with uh, UNET. One of the first things we tried is UNET, but uh, yeah, at the end, because this is a very sparse problem, you have a problem with the, the, with the UNET that the, there's a skip connection going through the top, right? And then that gradient becomes dominant and that sort of dominates everything. And then you have a hard trouble getting the small details and the small parts, which is actually the, the hardest part of this work. But you can't regularize that way. You can't just put pressure on, on this, this channel not carrying too much. So that's one of the things we tried. I, I probably could have tried harder, but one of the things we did is, uh, so you have a top skip connection, right, in the UNet type network. So you can try to put uh, convolutional layers there, right, to sort of make it hard to have the, the, the thing work. But we didn't have too much success with that. Maybe adding more regularization and stuff like that would work, but uh, it's a surprisingly hard problem and not having validation set is fairly frustrating because you have to sort of validate it yourself. And that makes you sort of, uh, di sort of discourages you from uh, trying to optimize those like last 3%, like an, an image that more people are fighting over really small percentages, right? And you probably can't visually distinguish that. And, and so that's, that's, that's probably one of the problems with this. So on that line, something like a perceptual loss or like uh, GAN networks are using FID loss would work, but uh, I don't think FID or something like on those lines would be able to capture the fine details because it's actually a, uh, yeah, you have to really do really well at, uh, with the fine details, and that's something that's uh, it's fairly hard. So, yeah, but along those lines, yeah, probably sparsity constraints or some sort of regularization might work. Okay, so time is running out. So, so let's thank the speaker again.